up in the morning beneath the stars so bright. Pull your hat down, make sure your cinch is tight. Horse is kinda snuffy, cold chill up your spine. It'll get your ass moving somewhere burning daylight. Kenley and we're burning daylight. Welcome to Burning Daylight, the only podcast for the working cowboy. Well, howdy there, daylight burners. <clears throat> Happy Monday. Hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, didn't get a show out to you on, uh, on Friday. I was kind of... I don't know. Had a had a lot of shit going on and uh kinda at a little bit of a writer's block, I guess, or whatever. And it seems weird because there's a lot of shit happening in the world and there's a lot of a lot of shit throughout history that I haven't covered, but for whatever reason I was just kinda at a blah. Didn't have anything I felt like you guys wanted to hear. <coughs> um anyway, I couldn't put it together. So um Hope you had a good weekend. Hope the the weather treated you all right. Um, and hopefully you guys down in Texas, uh, and I guess Nebraska's got some fires too, but uh, big ones down in, in Texas. So uh, stay safe out there. And uh, yeah, that fires are, it's, I mean, it's that time of year, but that's never fun. So anyway, you all take care down there. And um, well, I uh, I've been kind of, like racking my brain over this uh the the latest course of events um you know this this Russia Ukraine deal is uh is uh really really kind of gets you nervous you know that's a that's a that's a oh, I don't know what I don't even know what it's a scary deal uh when when you think about what it could could uh, ultimately lead to so uh you know I've been been thinking about that and uh, and trying to figure it all out because like I like we said before there's just the the amount of propaganda coming out of all different sides is just uh it's amazing to to watch but uh it also gives you a very very muddled view of what's what's actually going on and <laughs> I've listened to several different accounts and um you know there's uh there's a few, you know, and, and it's another thing to, uh, to talk about free speech because it, it's really hard to say, uh, to see a lot of the, the overt Russian propaganda. I'm sure there's some uh, circulating online kind of done covertly. But as far as like the media coming from Russia, it's like it's been kicked off of YouTube Russia Today and uh, it's the other one Sputnik or something like that. Uh and that's um well i i get if if you're given the most generous uh view of that you know of those moves i i get um trying to halt the spread of propaganda and because you know it, it propaganda is uh is dangerous information in general is that's the most dangerous thing in uh in war for warfare except for um you know ther thermonuclear weapons so um, minus that, the uh, the most dangerous thing about warfare is is information. That's why they always say the first casualty of war is uh, is the truth. And uh, and so by shutting off, um, you know, the the media coming out of Russia, uh, then we're forced to uh, listen to what is going to be propaganda from our side. <clears throat> and uh, and I say propaganda because it, it is. I mean our Hey, if the Russians can put out propaganda, then so can we. And uh, yeah, so I it just it's it's a good thing to be able to see what the hell they're saying, uh, just to get a better view of the picture. But anyway, uh, all that being as aside, uh, there's that uh, that old quote, you know, uh, those that don't learn from history uh, are doomed to repeat it. Uh, you know, history repeats itself. But I like the quote from from Mark Twain and. I forget where he said it or when, but it's uh, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, uh, doesn't repeat, but it surely rhymes. And, and I think that's a, a far more accurate uh, 
description of, of that, that kind of view, uh, the worldview anyway. So if you look back to uh, post-World War One, so World War I, it's a meat grinder of a war, uh, first time um, modern uh, weaponry saw full-scale engagement, and, you know, because of all these, these treaties and alliances and and just a bunch of just a, a whole bunch of different situations that led to it um brought the in basically the entire world into it and uh but uh the most of it was focused on the european continent and trench warfare all that and and as a result you had a, an entire generation of uh of brits french germans and uh you know and just the whole European continent, and uh, and then several. Uh, I, I don't know how many how many troops we lost, but we sent uh, upwards of a million troops over there at the end of um, World War One. Uh, so just you had an entire generation just uh, just chewed up, and uh, and just I mean just ground into a pulp by this this World War One uh, trench warfare and and just modern uh, weaponry. Uh, used for the first time, and there's uh, there's a bunch of different revolutions going on. You basically have the end of the the monarch system in in Europe uh, with with, uh, with this war, <coughs> and and you still you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, just colonial um, issues going on, and it's uh, it's a big time of unrest all the, all around the world and and the one i wanted to focus on here was uh was the irish war of independence and i think it mirrors kind of what's going on in ukraine pretty pretty uh closely so basically the <coughs> the the british took over uh ireland in like 1100 or something like that i mean long 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 time ago and since then there's been uh there's been some form of rebellion or another in in ireland uh actually i think kind of up and uh maybe not quite as much today but uh, as as recent as the the 80s and 90s i believe and the kind of the the modern state of it kind of kicked off in uh, 1912 so uh it started uh, the whole idea of home rule versus re the republic. And uh, in 1912, a political deal between the Irish Parliamentary Party and the Liberal Party at Westminster, the British government introduced uh, a bill for home rule, or limited autonomy for Ireland within the United Kingdom, as Irish nationalists had been demanding since the 1880s. However, this was opposed by Ulster Unionists, who formed their own militia, the Ulster Volunteers, to, uh, to oppose Irish self-government, Irish nationalists, in response, formed a rival militia, and the the Irish volunteers to ensure home rule was passed. Tensions between the two sides were were eased by the outbreak of the First World War, and uh, they both sides uh, agreed to support the British war effort. Uh, this is coming from uh, the Irishhistory.com. Um, however, in 1916, a more radish, radical Irish nationalist element in the Irish Volunteers, largely directed by the Irish Republican Brotherhood, unhappy with support for Britain, Britain in the war and believing that home rule fell far short of Irish independence, launched an, launched an insurrection known as the Easter Rising in Dublin, proclaiming an Irish Republic. So, we'll, uh... And during the Easter... Uh, uprising or the easter rising uh ch -ch -ch -ch. uh the volunteer irish volunteers have been found in 1913 blah 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 the citizens army with around 300 members was formed during the dublin lockout of 1913 to protect strikers from the police um ch -ch -ch -ch. all right so the national volunteers over 120,000 strong led by irish parliamentary party Party leader John Redmond were pledged to support the British war effort, and over 30,000 of them joined the British Army. The remaining 13,000 Irish volunteers, led by uh, Oin 
McNeil were com committed to keep their organization intact and in Ireland until home rule was passed. The Rising was planned in secret by seven men, mostly of the Irish uh, Republican Brotherhood, or IRB, who had formed a military council to, to this end just after the outbreak of the First World War. They were Tom Clark, Sean McDermott, Patrick Peirce, uh, Thomas McDonough, Joseph Plunkett, James Connolly, and Eamon Kant, Kant, I don't know. Um, their plans were, were not known to the membership of the volunteers or at large to the leaders of the IRB and volunteers. Um, they had arranged with the Germans for a large importation of arms to be delivered on Good Friday, April 21st, but the shipment was discovered by the British off Kerry and its cargo was lost. At the last minute, plans for the rising were revealed to Oin McNeil, who tried to call off the rebellion by issuing a countermanding order, but actually just po postponed the outbreak from Easter Sunday to the next day, Monday. The insurgents proclaimed an Irish Republic with Peirce as president and Connolly as commander-in-chief. They occupied positions around Dublin at the General Post Office, the Four Courts, South Dublin Union, Boland's Mill, Stephen, Stephen Green's, uh, and Jacob Biscuit Factory. I guess it's a cookie factory because uh, it's the English and they say biscuit like a bunch of morons. Um, and so that was kind of, compare that to the Crimean uh, deal uh, back in like 2014 when supposedly uh, like Russian sympathetic uh, Crimeans um, and if you, uh, according to our intelligence sources, there were also Russian special operators in with them, which, um, probably true. Um, but there's also, there's also the, the fact that Crimea is, uh, heavily ethnic Russian. And, uh, so there's some, some long, long, uh, sympathies towards Russia there. But anyway... This uh, Russian separatist party seized the the capital. I, th I think it was like the parliament there in uh, <coughs> in uh, Crimea. I, I forget which which city of Odessa. No, I don't. I don't know. I can't. I couldn't tell you. But so kind of view them as the Irish Republican Army. So in response to that, the Brits deployed like sixteen thousand troops, uh, like. Naval gunboats, uh, artillery. I mean, they they went in and just put this thing down. Um, so, da -da -da -dum. The rebels' headquarters at the GPO was bombarded into surrender, and Patrick Purse offer ordered on Saturday, twenty ninth of April. Uh, however, the fiercest fighting took place elsewhere at Mount Bridge Street, South Dublin Union, and North King Street. Uh, there was also risings in Galway, Ennis, uh, Enniscorthy, and Wexford, and Ashburn County, uh, Meath. But apart from an action at Ashbourne that killed 11 police, these caused a little blah. Uh, 16 of the rebel leaders were executed, 15 in a two-week period after they had surrendered, and one uh, Roger Casement in August. Over 3,000 people were arrested for after the re uh, rebellion and over 1,400 uh, imprisoned. The Rising was not widely supported among the Dublin public and was condemned by the Ar Irish Parliamentary Party and much of nationalist as well as unionist uh, opinion. However, combined with other factors such as con uh, continued postponement of home rule, growing casualties of the First World War, and the threat of conscription, the Rising and its repression helped to uh, increase the strength of the, of the radical nationalists in Sinn Féin, which was a, uh, that was like the, <laughs> Sin Fine was basically the the political arm of the the IRA, I think. Um, this party, which had not participated in the rebellion, was adopted as a vehicle by the veterans of the rising and pledged to withdraw from the Westminster Parliament and set up an Irish one. Sin Fine went on to win three by elections in 1917 and a general election in 1918, leading to their proclamation of an Irish Republic in 1919 and the start of the Irish War of Independence. 
So we go we go back to that and uh what <clears throat> what's kind of uniquely different about um this uh I, I guess that they're they're very similar. So Ukraine has been under Russian rule since like sixteen hundred or something like that. Um off and on um like switching sides like they were part of uh, Poland at one point they were part of uh, Norway I think Norway Sweden something like maybe it's Sweden um one of the one of those other slavic countries but um by and large they've been part of Russia and there's been rebellions here and there and uh never really fully independent until um like um uh, it started in, in 54 with Khrushchev, but they were still part of the Soviet Union. But after the Soviet Union fell in, in 89, that's when Ukraine kind of became a you know fully independent uh, nation state. And <clears throat> now, I guess where, where it rhymes as opposed to like where Ireland, Ireland was not really ever a, a uh, an independent country uh, and it still isn't completely independent there's still northern ireland which is part of the uh the uk and uh and then then there's the irish republic but there's uh so in, in that way it's kind of the same way as uh as uh, the russia ukraine thing but um and very much like uh, the Brits when they uh, when when this uprising took place in Crimea, even though it was probably a um, false flag type deal, uh, where heavily uh, heavily propagandized by the Russians and and infiltrated by the Russians, they they basically sparked off this this rebellion and. Uh, and that that's kind of what happened with uh this Luhansk and Donetsk uh, regions of Ukraine this time it was sparked off by by fighting and uh and rebellion and uh and Russia is using it as a as excuse to to protect its people whereas the Brits
Oh, uh, it's, it's too much stuff. Then what I did was I remortgaged my house and put Um, no, they, they were just outright putting down a rebellion. They, they were, uh, they were much more upfront about it. They, you know, they had, they tried to save face on the, on the world stage. Uh, there's a really good, um, series on Netflix, uh, called, uh, I think it's just called Rebellion and it's, and it's about the, there's two seasons. I think there's a third season coming out. I hope so. It's, Cause it's a really good show. And, uh, and it, it seems like it follows fairly fairly close the the timeline and 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 whatnot I, I haven't done enough research into it to to really say whether it's uh it's bullshit or not but it's uh it's a really really interesting show and but but it's very clear like the like the the brits were not they were not using any excuse to like protect um you know their their ethnic uh cousins or whatever uh no it was it was just like no the this is this is our land we want it and um you you will shut up now <laughs> that's kind of how it was so like the the brits were were like they were pretty ruthless about it and uh but at the same time the 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 world is getting a lot smaller because uh because of communication and everything i mean they they had a uh, you know uh telegraph underwater telegraph uh cables that went went from uh from america to the to europe uh and so the the communication time was was reduced uh really really rapidly and um and then the the radio uh became a thing people were were able to communicate via radio for the first time and <coughs> so people were able to to really pay close attention to what was going on uh, across the pond, and so Britain had a they had to put on a, a good face. So they uh, after after the Easter Rising, they uh, they were just like playing whack a mole, uh, and that's kind of how it always always happens with an occupying force. That does doesn't matter how much uh, you try to win over the public. You are still not their family, so they uh, they just resist you at every turn, and and if you squash one rebellion here, then then another one pops up over here, and, and you're just it's just a game of whack a mole, and that's kind of how um, how it was for the the Brits in, in Ireland, and that's kind of how it is for um, I, I I guess you could you could say that kind of how it is for uh, for Russia, but. In their case, they're they're uh, just 
they're just easing their way back. And, and, and there's, there's real concern about, um, you know, and, and I'm not comparing Putin to Hitler in the, the genocidal, um, madman type of, type of way I, I'm comparing to him and just how he's like creeping, you know, the, the whole appeasement thing, uh, where we, we figured if we, we gave, uh, if we allowed Germany to have the Sudetenland, then, uh, you know, his, he wouldn't, he wouldn't try to go any further, and that, you know, we were, we were wrong on that. <clears throat> I think everybody knew we were, we were going to be wrong, but what were, what were you going to do? And this, I, this kind of feels like how it is with Russia, too. Like, is it, is it right that, that he's invading Ukraine? Hell no, it's not, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's a lot more complicated than just, uh, than, and it's probably more complicated even than than the Ireland uh, England thing, because there's parts of Ukraine that are definitely sympathetic to Russia, and and like Northern Ireland, I guess kind of the same way. Um, they they're more of the the Protestant faith, where where the Irish Republic is is Catholic, and <coughs> I and I don't I don't know if there's a a big um, religious um thing going on with uh with ukraine i don't know if there's a big re religious divide like that you know protestant catholic or christian muslim or or whatever i know there's there's a pretty good amount of jews up there um but i, I don't know how it's split except for like um ethnic russians and non-ethnic russians and i don't know within the other part you know the non-russian end of it i don't know how they split up demographically either I, I just don't know that much about it um but i'm sure there's you know plenty of of different sects within the the non-russian ukrainian population because it's a big country it's like four, 40 million people it covers a lot of areas so i i don't know um how th how that splits up but there's but there's definite sympathies towards russia just like uh you know, Northern Ireland is is sympathetic to to the UK and still part of the UK. Um, <clears throat> and, and so maybe that's kind of where it, it you know the ideal situation seems to be maybe that like that that Lou Luhansk and Donetsk region um, becomes part of Russia or independent states and uh, and Ukraine you know is every is the rest of it and uh, and you know Crimea is part of Russia. I don't, I don't know if if it ends up like that. That seems to be like maybe that's the the best case scenario, uh, and just like allow for, uh, you know, whoever whoever doesn't want to be a Russian, uh, now is your time to leave. And and I, it, it sucks, but it sure as hell a lot better than than going going towards thermonuclear war. And and that was that was kind of the feeling in in Ireland. You know the nuclear option wasn't there because it wasn't invented yet. But um, I, you know the Brits really cracked down after that Easter Easter Rising, and so even though it um, oh let let's go go through here I guess so um, so in December nineteen eighteen, Sinn Fein decisively won the Irish vote in the general election, taking seventy three seats out of one hundred five. Uh, being a, a majority everywhere except Ulster, and that's uh, and that's Northern Ireland, and they declared an Irish Republic. The first Republican Ireland, uh, Republican Parliament or Dial, met January nineteen nineteen. Uh, through more than half the Sinn Fein members of Parliament were imprisoned at the time. Uh, um, on the same day that Dial first met, the two are uh. Eh, RIC constables were shot dead by Irish volunteers under Dan Breen at Soldenburg and anyway, somewhere. And the explosives they were carrying seized. This is commonly presented as the opening shots of the war, but there were deaths in 1918, and only 17 more people were killed in 1919. <clears throat> in Dublin, Michael Collins, uh, the volunteers or IRA director of intelligence and uh, formed a squad to assassinate detectives who coordinated 
The arrest of Republican activists late in the year, his men attempted but failed to, to kill John French, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Alongside the limited armed uh, campaign were sig uh, significant passive resistance, uh, resistance, including hunger strikes by prisoners, many of whom were released in March 1920, and a boycott by railway workers on carrying British troops. There was also significant disturbances in uh, rural areas as small farmers attempted to seize parts of large ranches. Uh, violence intensified in early 1920. Much of the Sinn Féin political leadership had been arrested. Eamon de la Vera, uh, the president of the republic, had gone to America to raise funds. The two leaders of the IRA, Collins and Richard M M Mulcahy, Mulcahy uh, ordered volunteer units around the country to raid RIC barracks for arms. Though Dial eventually endorsed the IRA's campaign, campaign in 1921, some Simfine figures such as Arthur Griffith disliked the use of violence. A series of attacks on rural police barracks ensued in 1920. Uh, the RIC withdrew from its smaller stations into fortified barracks and towns, and abandoned posts were systematically burnt by the IRA around the country on the night of Easter Sunday, 1920. By the summer of 1920, many RIC men were resigning their commissions, and, and in many localities, the IRA were uh, in the ascendant. In other places, the RIC responded to attacks on them with assassination of Republicans such as Thomas McCurtain, the Lord Mayor of Cork. At the same time in the summer of 1920, Sinn Féin won local government elections across most of Ireland and took over functions of government from the state such as tax collection and law enforcement. In some places, the RIC was replaced by uh, Irish Republican police and the court system by the Sinn Féin or Dial Courts. To put down this insurgency, the British government under Lloyd George proposed autonomous governments in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, Ireland and also deployed new corps of paramilitary police from Britain. The Black and Tans Auxiliary D Division made up of largely war veterans from the First World War. Lloyd George also passed the Restoration of Order Act, uh, an Ireland Act, giving special powers to the police and military. So, they... Uh, they basically just uh, grassroots and and through just uh, just continuing uh, oppression by the British government, they they got a lot of uh, local favor, and uh, and they won all these these local elections, <coughs> and and the Brits are still trying to hold on, still trying to hold on, and uh, it's funny how it's kind of the opposite way with uh, with Ukraine, where it's Ukraine is you know the break off country but they're still trying to hold together this larger part and they're and they're kind of losing that battle it seems like or it seemed like they were losing that battle anyways i mean the the those eastern regions of ukraine had had a lot of russian intervention already you know but they they, they weren't they weren't wearing the russian flag you know they they didn't have any any you know russian flag on 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 their shoulder no no patch there but they, no doubt, were were Russian soldiers, and um, and Ukraine's try, uh, trying to battle against that, and that that's kind of that's kind of what they're doing here with this uh, black and tans, where they're paramilitary. So that's you know they're 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 doing spy shit, and uh, so on the escalation. This triggered a grave escalation of the conflict as new forces carried out reprisals on the civilian civilian population for IRA attacks and. Uh, in the summer of 1920, uh, burning extensive parts of the towns of uh, Balbriggan and Tuam, for example. The IRA, in response, formed full-time flying columns, also called active service units, in which in some parts of the country became much more ruthless and efficient at guerrilla warfare. And uh, so there's uh, there's a, a scene where they're, they, uh, one of the main characters in Rebellion goes up, goes up north because uh, his brother... <clears throat> is uh is in the British uh army and uh is going up up uh north towards the like kind of the border between uh the Irish Republic and Northern Ireland uh, to help put down a rebellion gets captured but they're talking about the northern boys and uh like they they were apparently just really brutal they they uh they bombed a lot of shit 
and uh, and we're just they they were kind of like the Francis Marion Swamp Fox, you know, in the during our Revolutionary War, where they just they had, they had hit you really hard and fast, and then just uh, away they'd go into the countryside. Um, in the north, there was severe riding in Belfast, uh, Belfast, Derry, and Lisbon after an uh, after RA, IRA killing of two northern Protestant police officers in separate incidents, after which loyalists attacked Catholic areas. Up to 100 people were killed and hundreds of Catholic homes burnt. Um, another 7,000 Catholics were expelled from their jobs in the Belfast shipyards. <clears throat> the Northern Ireland authorities also formed the Ulster Special Constabulary as an armed, mostly uni unionist police force. The autumn and winter of 1920 saw new ruthlessness on both sides. Um, November 21, on November 21, IRA units in Dublin launched a mass assassination attack on British intelligence officers, <clears throat> killing 14 men, of whom at least eight were intelligence officers. In revenge, uh, a force of RIC black and tans and auxiliaries shot dead 15 civilians at a football match at uh, Dublin's Croke Park in a day known as Bloody Sunday. A week later, uh, a patrol of 17 auxil auxiliaries was wiped out uh, in an RA IRA ambush in Kilmichael and Cork, and shortly after that, much of Cork city center was destroyed in a fire set by Crown forces. <clears throat> By the end of 1920, some 500 people had been killed. There was an, there were attempts to call a truce in December, but this was prevented by the British government. In particular, Hamar Greenwood, the chief secretary secretary of Ireland, who insisted the IRA surrender its weapons first. Um, in the first six months of 1921, around a thousand people were killed in the fighting. The the violence was most Intense in Dublin City, South Munster, and Belfast, although there was some guerrilla activity in, in most areas. County Cork saw almost 500 people killed in actions like the Upton ambush. And uh, in Dublin, 300. <coughs> well, <coughs> <coughs> well, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, County Cavan saw only nine deaths in Wicklow, seven. In addition, some 6,000 Republicans were imprisoned. Martial law was declared uh, in the province of Munster. <clears throat> the, the regular British army was deployed in greater numbers, uh, mounting sweeps across the countryside, and British authorities began official uh, reprisals, including house burnings and executions in response to the IRA attacks. The IRA re retaliated by stepping up shootings of informers, real and alleged, eventually extending tracts of uh, uh, extending attacks to off-duty British personnel and burning the property of loyalists. <coughs> hmm. when, the <coughs> when the British began executing prisoners, the IRA also began shooting captured British soldiers and police. By the summer of 1921, the IRA was very short of ammunition and weapons, and many fighters had been imprisoned, notably in the raid on the Customs House in Dublin. British forces claimed they were on the verge of defeating them, but the guerrillas had also improved their bomb-making cap uh, capabilities and were still inflicting casualties and no immediate end uh, in sight to the conflict. The fighting was brought to an end, however, on J July 11, 1921, when a truce was negotiated between British and Ir Irish Republican force so that talks on a political settlement could be begin. In the North, though, uh, the second half of 1921 was more violent than the first, with extensive fighting between Republicans and Loyalists, uh, Catholics and Pro and Protestants, especially in Belfast. <coughs> so compare that to after the Crimea deal. Um, there's there's kind of a ceasefire, but these two Donetsk and the Donbass region still still fighting like hell. Um, the truce allowed the IRA to regroup, recruit, and train openly. M many of their activists believed this. Uh, believed at first it was just a temporary uh, end to hos uh, hostilities. However, in 19, December 1921, an Irish delegation, led by Michael Collins and Arthur Griffin, signed the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which uh, disestablished the 
Irish Republic of 1919, but created the Irish Free State, uh, an entity, entity comprising 26 of Ireland's 32 counties, which had much more independence than the Home Rule Act of 1912 would have granted. Um, so anyway, basically, uh, more fighting goes on, and uh, it's... Uh, and it just it's one one thing leads to another and then eventually the the Irish independent Irish free state was established in 1948 uh the republic of ireland and fully independent and then northern ireland uh also so it's independent but it remained part of the united kingdom so <clears throat> i guess not fully independent um <coughs> and like I said, it history doesn't repeat, it, but it it damn sure rhymes. And this, you can you compound that with like the the economic um, shit that's going on with inflation and uh, and just greater spending and just all all these all these entangling alliances once again. And we're uh, we we are knocking on the door of something really really awful. So I I hope I hope. Uh, this Ukraine deal kind of gets resolved much like the <clears throat> the Ireland situation and uh, and however that, that plays out, you know, territorially and, and comes to some sort of a ceasefire and we can all just kind of take a deep breath and, and back off because uh calling for for no fly zones o over ukraine um uh, as, as at this point in the in the conflict essentially means declaring war on russia and we all know where that that escalation leads to and that's that's not not worth it so hopefully they can get it resolved semi peacefully um but man it, it's it is really really kind of crazy to see how how similar all this stuff is and yeah we'll see where it goes from here but anyway i hope you enjoyed it i hope you have a good rest of the week the, the weather is sure improving and uh that puts people in a better mood so um things are looking up fellas things are looking up um so make sure you go check out the the website burning-daylight.com we got some t-shirts for sale there we'll have hats up there uh, so, uh soon shortly and uh Check out the Uncommon Sense blog. Um, Jen Hill putting out uh, an article every week. Um, Mackenzie will, will post from uh, there from time to time. And uh, yeah, we got some cool stuff uh, going, and we'll uh, we uh, got some got some plans in the future too. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, oh yeah, Patreon.com/slash Burning Daylight if you'd like to support the show, and uh, <clears throat> also if you'd like to to advertise uh get get your your business out there a little bit in within this community uh sh you know shoot me a message uh matt at burning dash daylight.com um but patreon.com slash burning daylight you can subscribe there you'll get bonus content ad free content and uh and a whole bunch more so and you be helping out the show a bunch so anyways um god bless thank you for tuning in and move your ass we're burning daylight you rise up in the morning beneath the star so bright pull your hat down make sure your cinch is tight horse is kind of snuffy cold chill up your spine we'll get your ass moving sun we're burning Sure you sit up tall I can see the horizon
horizon It's looking pretty bright We'll get your ass moving, son We're burning daylight Tell the job's done right